Any other questions? Yeah, my only one was uh, a notation thing. When some of these problems, they'll state is S input. Is that the same <clears throat> as uh, Q sub M or our magnetic far? No. No, okay. Okay, so if you look at the homework note, I'll just shift to it real quick here. Handout from the last class. Here, uh, this is it. There's a lot of information in the last lecture. Uh, no, this isn't it. This is it. Come on. Okay, at the very beginning, right, um, this kind of helps you. There's a difference, right? So S is equal to, uh, S is the volt amperes, and it's equal to the P, P sub C, the core loss, plus J, Q sub M, the magnetizing vars. So oh, okay. Thank that's you. the difference right there. Okay. See, I didn't. I wasn't pointing to you that S. Your S of P is your S input. Okay. Thank you. The subscripts on the S's and all that can be all over the map. Okay. It's just read the problem and the way people use subscripts will vary. You know, in the book, the way I do it, I can't guarantee. Even some of the homeworks that we use are going to be different sometimes. And uh, so, so you have to be flexible there and understand, you know, what's the question, what's the question asking for? Even now, I've kind of made up some uh, notations here. So the first thing I want to do quickly here if we go back to this problem that I showed you and we did a primary referred circuit where we came up with the final values for uh, referring the primary side so so to highlight this, the secondary side, x2, that's this value right here. If you, you multiply it times the turns ratio squared to refer it over to the primary side. And uh, this is r2 right here. This is xl2 what I'm calling the leakage reactants. Okay, so that's, and this is your impedance. If you, if you knew your impedance of your load, you would reference it over the same way. So it's by the square of the turns ratio. You multiply it going from the secondary to the primary. And I have all these equations under here to show these are really, I would, I would put all these equations under, you know, on my eight and a half by 11 notes right here. And uh, in addition to that, understand the difference between when I'm saying a primed value or if I'm just talking about uh, voltage on one side of the transformer versus voltage on the other. The whole idea is let's get this circuit simplified so we can analyze it. And there's a, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. Uh, so I want to give you a demonstration of another way. Let's say that we go to this circuit here and we um, were to, just a moment, I'm trying to pull up on my, just a sec, I want to be able to 
look at this while I'm writing it. Uh, so we had uh, the uh, well, maybe I can just flip in between back and forth here. These uh, terms right here, I know I'm going to just copy them and paste them over to the other thing. piece of junk. All right. Unless you put a little dot here, it's going to paste it from some random place. Okay, so these were the uh, primary side referred values. What if we did it secondary side? What would we come up with? Um, and that's what I'm going to write here on this uh, example. So I have, I'm now going to refer everything to the secondary side. The load voltage here on the secondary side, we had already known that was uh, V2, 40, zero degrees. We specified that in the beginning. Um, and as far as the parameters go, we we go over here to the picture I was showing you, um, 0.68 and 0.14. Four nine. So this is point one four nine. That would be the actual ohmic measurement of the resistance from the secondary side, and this would be point six eight. So now we need to look at XL one, which is six point one five, but we need to divide it by the turns ratio. So this is this value here is going to be 6.15 divided by 3 squared because we're going to the other side. We're going the opposite direction. We're going to do a division. The impedance is going to go down because we're on the low voltage side of a transformer. And that is... Uh, point it's the same number, <laughs> duh, because I said that these two are equal to each other, right? But the resistance was slightly different, so I have a 1.17, but I'm going to move it to the other side uh, that and divide that by 9, and I get 0 0.13. I'd also want to move the x sub m in the RC. So I've got 2.6 kilo ohms was on the primary side. I'm going to take that and divide it by 9 and I get 289. So this one is J uh, 289 ohms, and then the R sub C, divide 1300 by 9, and I get 144 ohms. So in, uh, I, uh, we could solve this whole problem. Uh, you can take it from here. I'm not going to finish it, but remember that we specified the load on the secondary side as being a hundred volt amperes with a power factor on the load side of 0.95 leading. 
So if I gave you all that information, you can easily solve the rest of this problem. Because what we did was we worked our way back with this problem and we solved for uh, V1 and I1. That's, uh, you can get I2 from this information here. All this information here, you can calculate I2 from that. And uh, everything is, be, you can work this whole problem simply working it from the secondary side as well. Is there any questions about that? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so what if the power factor isn't given in this problem? Is there a way to find it? Uh, no. Uh, no, you, well, unless it's, unless the power is given. So... Oh, the poor lost power? Yeah, uh, no, okay, no, the load. Now we're talking about a load, right? Uh, you know, don't, don't get mixed up between two things. Some of the problems that you're solving are representing doing open circuit tests and short circuit tests, right? Every, every circuit... Every time you look at a circuit for a, the transformer, you consider, well, what kind of a load does it have? And you can start with this equivalent circuit right here if, if it helps. So you can say, okay, uh, I'm doing an open circuit test. Then what does my equivalent circuit look like? It has the... Um, it's got these things here, but because it's open circuited on the other side, there's no current flowing. So the voltage that you would be measuring, this would be the V2 prime. So the voltage you measured reflected to the primary side. If you were given the uh, core loss, and you were given, say, the uh, power factor. You could solve everything this way, looking in from the in, uh, this side. What you would have to do, if you don't have these values for the open circuit test, then just neglect them. And it'll make like about 1% difference on your answer. If you're doing a short circuit test, you neglect this branch. You, you have this, if you saw, put a little red mark here, neglect it. I'm doing a short circuit test. I've got information there. Uh, I may be given the, uh, in this case, um, you'd still be given the, maybe you'd be given the S and the power factor. Or you might be given S and P. You can still find everything you need looking from the input side. In this case, what you're doing is you're shorting, so it's like your load impedance is zero. And in that case, you can neglect the core loss to come up with an estimate for what. So what you're trying to do in the, you're trying to find these with the short circuit, you're trying to find this with the open circuit. And but then a problem where you already know the parameters and you're given a load, that's what I don't want you to confuse with this because that's a different type of a problem. In that problem, you're going to be given information. So one way to, is that you've got your, your circuit looks like this. You have some load, 
let's say you know everything. You know R1, you know XL1, XL2, R2, JXM, RC. Sometimes I might tell you that this is infinite. Then that means that it's then you wouldn't use it, right? In fact, I'm going to take one of, if we did a problem like this on an exam, there's no way I'd give have you uh, do both of these because it would take too long to do. Probably take the whole exam period. But then what do I give you? Well, I might give you the S of the load and the power factor. Or I might give you the power of the load and the power factor. Or I might give you the uh, impedance of the load. Or I might give you the, uh, in a rare occasion, I could give you the power of the load and the Q of the load. Q is usually, it's not something that's typically uh, specified or measured, but it comes from the, the S is very simple because what is S? It's the volts times the amps. So if you know the volts, if you know S, so if you have S, magnitude of the S, and you've got the voltage at the load, so you'd have to, you'd probably also have to have one more thing. You'd have to have the voltage at the load, voltage at the load. In these cases, you'd have to have this. Here, you wouldn't need any of it. You'd need to have, let's, I'm assuming in all these cases uh, that I have, I know one of the voltages, either on the input or the output side. And you look at the information that you've been given, and really what you're trying to do is you're saying, okay, if, if I have load information and no source info, then you work from the load back to the source. That's what we, the example in last lecture did. If I have source information and no, and I have no load information, then you work from the source to the load. Does that help? Yeah, that helps. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, now, what, back up to this one just one moment also. Uh, I told you about per-unitization in the last lecture, at the end of the last lecture. When you per-unitize something, you have to establish a base. But the choice of the base is arbitrary. You just want to make sure it's a useful choice. So when I mean the base, I got the base of usually the volt ampere base, the voltage base. That's, you have to at least have that. And then from those things, you can find I base which would be S base divided by V base. And you can find the Z base, which is the V base divided by the I base. This is just two steps. You could find Z base. Another way you could say Z base would be equal to the V base squared divided by the S base also. So Anyway, once you know your base, so you have to have a V base, you've got to have an I base, 
and you've got to have a Z base. Then you divide everything out by these bases and that's per unit. Sometimes people uh, say per unit. It's really kind of the same as a percentage. I.e. if you're at 100% load, that would mean a one per unit load, and that would be that you're, op you're at the base SB. Now if you, if you uh, in this problem here that was in the prior uh, lecture, we referred everything to the primary, we could have just as well referred everything to the secondary. And we, in, if we were going to do that, we would probably want to establish a different base quantities. So we would have st still said, let's make the S base 100 volt amperes. But now let's make the V base 40 volts RMS. It wouldn't make any sense to make the, uh, to use the 120 if you're doing it on the secondary side, right? And, and then you just, and then you would just go through and find your I base, right? It's going to be a bit, a much bigger number that it'll be a uh, hundred divided by uh, 40. Over here, recall, the I base was 0.83 amps. That's essentially like the rated current from the primary side. But the rated current on the secondary side would be 100 volt amperes divided by 40. And that would be 2.5 amperes. And then you could find your Z base on the uh, secondary side, and that would be 100 divided by 2.5. Oh, not 100, I'm sorry, 40 divided by 2.5, because your V base is 40. And that would be 16 ohms. So now what you've got is you've got all these base quantities here. And if I went back to this secondary side and I were going to use uh, to get the per unit, um, use the uh, secondary side ba uh, base quantities. So do you have any questions? Does that make sense to everybody? This all should be kind of a review. It's just like a different way of looking at the problem. All good. Okay, good. Okay, now let's go look about at this particular problem we ended up with at the end of last lecture where I had referred everything to the primary side and we looked at it in per unit. And if you recall uh, early on in this class in Appendix 1A, Module 1, I told you what, that we needed to use per unit and there's a really good reason for it and that is when we are considering um, looking at a phaser, a phaser diagram. And I think one, some of the homework, one at least one homework might ask you to draw a phaser diagram. So I want to show you that. And uh, what is what is it? Well, um, this is the problem that we just that we solved in the last um, lecture. And what we did 
you could almost solve this problem graphically without having to do all of the math if you simplify things down a little bit. That's a, a point one about this whole thing. How would we do that? Well, if you look at this circuit and you look at the the resistance values, they're quite a bit lower than the uh, reactance values. And in fact, these impedances here are quite small. And that tells you that if I do a phaser, I'm going to be doing phasers with some pretty small uh, phaser amplitudes to do my, to solve my problem. Because it, um, I, uh, so in reality, it's, that's why I kind of have this zoomed in a little bit so you can see what I did. Uh, this right here shows how would I find uh, the, the voltage. So this is that's V1 right there that phaser and that is that then from that I would know that this must then be 5.1 degrees and the amplitude of this vector that phaser amplitude would have to be 0.998 and if recall that I had um, said that it was seemed weird that our voltage of the input of the transformer was lower than the voltage of the output. Well, the phasor diagram can help you understand how that happened. So we established what you were given was you were given V2 here v2 prime and we referenced it at zero degrees that enabled us to be able to get the load power factor and and give this would have been the power factor at the load and the power factor angle there would have been it's leading so a bit 18.19 degrees and that would be the inverse cosine of 0.95 and being the leading power factor it would be a positive angle. So you actually start out the problem knowing two things. You know this and you know this. From that you could say well I'm going to simplify down my uh, um, I'm going to simplify this problem and one way to do it and it's not going to give me the exact answer is to just neglect the magnetizing branch um, but there, um, there's another way to do it and to get the exact answer so the first thing I did was I said okay well let's just neglect it so that would mean that the I uh, 1 equals I 2 prime and I know I 2 prime because that is that's this phaser right here I was able to derive I 2 prime from all the information that was given and the so then if I want to find the V1, I have to find the voltage drop across these two um, reactances. Now in this uh, diagram here, I actually, this is an exact uh, calc, um, phaser diagram because what I did was I, I'm showing 
in phasers exactly what we did at the end of the last lecture. So at the end of the last lecture, we, we did this right, not quite at the end, but we went through this really big problem and I did the current division to find I1. And then I, uh, once I knew I1, and so once I knew this and I know this, I would be then be able to find the voltage drop across here and the voltage drop across here. And I added those up. So here's the one voltage drop. There's another voltage drop. I would add them to this voltage and I would get the input voltage. And this, what I'm showing here, is one of the fa phasers. So recall that it had a, if, if you multiplied this value, it ends up coming out to this. This is the voltage drop on the across R1, X, L1. And then this one here is the voltage drop across R2 prime, X, L2 prime. And we ended up with these angles of more than 90 degrees. So it pushed us into the other quadrant. So essentially that tells me I can think about what do I have right here in terms of a phaser. Well, this phaser looks, it's a little bit more than 90 degrees. So it's, it's an arrow that looks like that. And this phaser is just even a little bit more than that, 95 degrees. And what I could do is you say, okay, adding these together as phasers, you could take these two guys and, and connect them together. And if you knew that you had um, you've got this is the end of uh, this is V2 prime right here. That's little arrow end of V2 prime and you add it to that you're going to get V1 this way. So that's what I did here added these up. This is the secondary. This is the one across the secondary and this on the bottom. This is the one across the primary on the top. Add them together and I get V1. Well, if I were to estimate it like this, what I would be doing is I would be saying that here's my current right here. So there's I2. And remember I showed you this trick in, uh, and I can't rotate these vectors, so I kind of have to draw them. But if I were to just draw a line along like this. This is I2. This could be J I2 prime. I, I've got part of the problem already. And in order to get the voltage drop, it would be J times the sum of the two X's times I2 prime. And so that would give me this little, would scale it back because the two X's are 0.04 and 0.04. So I'd have about a little less than 10% of the total length. And then if I picked that thing up here, I could move that and then there I've got an estimate of an 
an estimate of V1 where it meets that point. It's a little bit off, but it's pretty close. And if I did that, then what I'm going to end up with, and I did, I calculated the final answer, I ended up with a V1 of 0.98 at 4.46. The actual answer is 0.998 at 5.1. So I'm not, I'm off, you know, one, around 1% 1 error or something like that. But it's probably gets me in the ballpark. What did this do to the power factor? So how do I find power factor? And here's an important point. You say, oh, power factor is the current uh, what is power factor, right? If I look over here at the load, the power factor is going to be equal to the cosine of the angle of the current at the load. But if I looked over here, the power factor is not equal to the cosine of the angle of I1. Because to make this assumption on the right, I have to know, I have to have this. Really, in general, what I'm saying is that the power factor angle is equal to the negative of the angle of the voltage minus the angle of the current. It's it's really that the, the uh, angle between the voltage and the current and uh, it's it's the uh, negative of whatever you end up with there because because remember that why is that because if you had a z and you want to know what's the angle of a z it would be the angle of the voltage minus the angle of the current, right? And that's what we called phi z. And remember that we said that phi z is equal to the negative of the power factor angle. And that's why I have this negative here. So if I want to know what the power factor is, the real power factor, it's going to be 5 point one minus uh, in this case uh, let me double check because I have gone through and I calculated all these things um, well let's go through this go back here and I got 7.16 angle. That's what I came up with for the for the input, and I'm taking and it's a positive, so I'm getting a little. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, so if I do this, I'm taking 5.1 minus 7. 0.16 and it's going to be around um, 2 degrees. That would be the power factor. There, this is the exact power factor angle. And so it's leading, but it's almost unity. But if I if I do this estimate right here, it's there's quite a bit angular difference between this and this those are the two currents 
So the 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 amplitudes are almost identical, but the angles are quite different. And that's the impact of the excitation current in this branch. So you're going to come up with an error that's relatively significant in the power factor if you make this assumption. So the power factor would be cosine of 2 degrees, which is about 0.99. If I take this um, approximate circuit and I find it, then the the action the, I come up with a power factor angle of 13.73. So that's quite a bit more than two. You know, it's 10, 10 degrees more. And I think our uh, well, I may have had my amplitudes wrong on this picture here. I think it's more like like this. that I would have come up with with the estimate. And so I end up with this is my 0.97 leading. So yeah, it's a little bit less leading than 0.95, but it's not quite as, as much. So is there any questions on that? Do you guys pretty much follow that idea? I'm hearing silence, so... Seems pretty good, just kind of double-checking what we got, right? Yeah, and it's looking at it from a different perspective, yeah. Now, what you can do, and I'm not, this is not a class in circuit theory, and if, I'll tell you what, I don't know how good they teach this now, but, and maybe I just wasn't a great student when I was in Europe, shoes, but uh, Thevenin, uh, there's this thing called Thevenin and Nort or Norton equivalent circuits, right? And you're supposed to learn that in your first years of, of engineering, but you can, and that you're supposed to be able to take some really goofy looking uh, circuits. And what the Thevenin does is it takes your a really goofy looking circuit and it makes it just look like, say, uh, let's say you've got two, a voltage source and you've got a voltage, this is, I'm gonna call this a voltage sink. It could be a load, but it, you know, it's another voltage in your circuit, and all of the impedances could be uh, summed up in this one thing right here. That would be your Z Thevenin. If it was a Norton, it's the dual of that, and you would have to actually convert to currents This would be, I don't know, Z Norton. I don't know if they even say that. This would be your current sink, see, or load. Your current sink or, or your load. And you could make it all look like this. So you can get circuits into one single impedance and then it makes it easy. And we're going to do that in the very last module of the class with the induction motor. But uh, otherwise, we're not really going to have to do this. But it's, I'm just telling you that this is kind of a quantum step that's taken in Chapter 2 by the authors that isn't explained really well. Um, and what... What it means is that you could take your equivalent circuit for the transformer, which is this pretty complicated looking thing right here. And there's your load. 
and uh, you could do uh, a feminine and manipulations of everything. And no, here's one other thing. Uh, let's assume I got to make an important point here. Let's assume that you kept this voltage exactly as what it was. So this is the voltage at the load. Okay, so you're not going to change that, but you would have had to change your your voltage at the source somehow. And let's say here you knew your current at the load, but you would have had to change, say you had a voltage source, but you would have had to convert that voltage source into an a voltage source into an equivalent current source. You know, so in other ways, this might be a V1 equivalent and an IS equivalent. So it, it assumes that you've done something like that. Well, what you could do with this is you could rearrange your circuit and you could move things around. And there's your load right here. So now I've made it a lot easier to analyze because I've I've actually essentially moved, taken this guy here and moved it over to there. But in order to do that, uh, I would have had to have modified um, all of these things they would be a little bit different for that to work. Um, and I could also have done it the other way. Where this makes a heck of a lot less sense. Or maybe not. This is it's fine. I could have done it this way. But then I would have had to modify, well, this would have to be modified too, but essentially I'd be modifying this part of the circuit here. So if you want to know how to do that, there's tons of really great YouTube videos that explain that. Uh, but at the end of the day, what we tend to do with transformers, if we're really doing uh, a bigger picture problem, which we're going to get into with the three phase. We're going to convert everything into something like this. And, uh, and so at the end of the day, the problem would just be framed to you as giving you this and this, let's say, and then you have to find this. So it's, it's, if you can get your circuit into this uh, um, form, or if it's given to you, it makes everything a lot easier, right? So anyway, let's, let's talk about regulation. So I'm going to jump to a different topic. If, is there any protestation to that? Okay, so um, what is regulation? Regulation is um, really a way of analyzing how good of a transformer you have from the standpoint of its ability to give a faithful voltage to a load. But does anybody here, has anybody here heard of the term regulation before? Yes. Yeah, what, what is your understanding of it, Brandon? My understanding of voltage regulation is the, basically the, kind of like you said, the efficiency of the transformer. So it's the factor of whatever I feed into my transformer, it's not going to be perfect 
coming out, so you always have to take that into account, especially with the uh, different sensors and whatnot, especially if you're, say, stepping it down to DC. So you got to take into account how much of a, in, es in essence, a loss in the voltage you're going to get on the out on the other side of your transformer. Yeah, that's that's actually very true. That is actually an even more general, typically regulation. You know, it comes from the word regulate. So you're trying to regulate or control something. And you were talking about going from an AC to a DC. Well, that would be like a power supply. And let's say you're, you've got your transformer is part of it. Uh, you know, as I'm showing right here. And then maybe you've got a something else inside of here that's converting it to DC and then you might even have an active power electronic circuit that's trying to regulate your voltage as close as it possibly can get to DC and if you've got any sensor error the sensor error might in the control might factor into your regulation um, as well but we're in fact in reality if you have a a controller with say a proportional plus integral control then it's supposed to have zero steady state error and so any regulation error that you measure is sensor error that's it because the pi regulator would drive out all other things it's just going to regulate to what it thinks it's seeing but uh, that's you know in general but if we're just talking about a transform we're really talking about a passive thing and obviously if we put a uh, a voltage in here there's going to be a voltage drop some equivalent drop so we're going to get less voltage out here it was interesting when we uh, that's now here's what's interesting I would have said that if I until we did this leading example right Notice that we had the leading example, and we actually had an increase in voltage. This is bigger. And if I had a lagging situation, here's what I would have gotten. Let's say I had 0.8 degree lagging, and this is what I usually give as an example. Uh, then this is more in line of what I'd expect to see with regulation. Here's the current I2 prime, and this is a power factor angle, so this would be negative inverse cosine of 0.8 or negative 36 point, I think it's 36.6 or something like that degrees for and 0.8 is a very, very common power factor. I've told people in the class before, I don't know if I'm repeating myself here, but if you were to measure, I'd say before power electronics and renewable energies and all that became, so, and, and energy storage became such a huge part of our grid. So let's go back to when I was in school back in the, in the early 80s. Uh, this would have been true because most, hardly any of the power and energy that we used was regu was actively controlled. And uh, it was all through transformers and it was all feeding motors, which are all, if they're induction motors, lagging loads. And so I would say if you took the entire world's load and fed it from one giant generator, it would have a 0.8 lagging power factor. And I think if you would have averaged everybody out, that's probably what you would get because motors are such a huge part of our of our grid. And uh, I work on, mo uh, most of my career was on ships. And because of EMI and power quality problems on the Navy ships and the amount of space that it takes to mitigate those problems, there is not a lot of active power electronic regulation control of the loads on most uh, Navy ships, for example. So it was always a good assumption to assume that you had a 0.8 power factor load. And then we actually designed 
uh, power electronic versions of the generation systems. That's what I spent most of my career doing. But we had to assume that everything we were feeding was was operating at 0.8 lagging. So it's a common power factor. And, and this is your load voltage right here, V2 prime. Now, if I were to do my little trick and say, okay, this is J I2 prime here, and then I want to find J times the X that I've been given for the simple uh, problem, J X2 prime, then what I've done is I've, uh, and let me double check my, I did this last night. Um, the simple 0.8, I, yeah, I think that's, that's about right. Okay. You guys are saying, well, what's he doing? Well, I'm just trying to remind myself. Um, I think I ended up with a slight, uh, um, I think it would follow the same trend as we saw before. Well, it makes sense. Okay, so this would have been my approximate V1. This is my actual V1. But what you see is that it's it's uh, it has to be more. I have to supply more voltage, this amplitude of this phaser here the amplitude of V1 is greater than the amplitude of V2. And that's the normal situation. Same thing if it was just a, a unity load, which means I if might, I move uh, that. Question, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so, and instead of doing all of that, uh, I think you you try to be like a pinpoint accurate. Do you think that also gonna work uh, when you know exactly what's the real power on the left side and the real power on the right side, and you from there you can find cosine of any angle of power factor also. Yeah, you can if you know, you know, I, you know, I had to have, I had to know the impedance too, though. Yeah, let's say you are given the impedance. Yeah, you could do that. Because you know that, right? So you got to measure it somehow. Yeah. Without, before connecting to any, you know, circuit and, and you know, from your model, your I, you know, your V, expected V, and you know the power, the most important, everything like except power, I guess. Mm -hmm. And from there you can find cosine of phi. Yeah, I, I, you're, yeah, you're right, Mustafa. I mean, you can if you're given, and this is actually a good example of say a homework problem. I mean, a, a test exam problem too. You may not be given all of this pinpoint accurate information. You might just be given the power at the load and the power at the source, and the impedance, and being asked to find the current. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah, and uh, maybe if we're just given the rating at the input, maybe we, we say, do you think it's safe to uh, assume also the rating at the output is very, very close? Well, okay, yeah, but there's that's regulation. So you're right. Uh, and what happens, you're actually, what the whole the definition of regulation is, if the voltage, what you do with regulation is you assume that you're applying rated voltage to the input of the transformer, first of all. And now we gave an example where we were applying, we were saying the rated voltage was at the output. But if you said, I'm applying the rated voltage at the input, that's really what you do with regulation and you say, okay, what, how much, what am I going to get at the output voltage? Is it, is it going to be higher or lower? That's the regulation. So if, if uh, the reg 
is equal to uh, it's basically less than uh, zero percent. Like if I, I'm sorry, let me think here. Yeah, zero. So the regulation is the drop, the difference between these. So if V2 equals V1, you have zero percent. That's a perfect, perfect, there's no drop. If it's less than zero percent, if it's a negative no, uh, percentage, we know that we have a leading power factor load. If the reg is greater than 0%, we have a unity or lagging power factor load. So that's one thing regulation tells us. So you could be given the regulation and uh, find out exactly what, what we're trying to find instead of having to do all this really detailed math. Um, can we also like uh, assume like uh, there is no losses at the beginning, and we so we have a transformer. We want the other end, which is the secondary side. We want to supply this much of current, and we want like a perfect voltage. Then we work backward till we get to the regulation, and instead we say okay, instead we have an input of 120 volt. Maybe we say we have an input of 120.6 volt. Or, mm -hmm whatever so is that you think it get, makes sense yeah it does but but it all makes sense but recognize one thing we're just talking about transformers transformers are always going to have some impedance and it's going to be dominated by the leakage inductance it's going to be dominated by by these two things right here that'll be the dominant thing that affects your regulation and so you can't eliminate that it, because it's it, because that's i mean it can it can be minimized through a very uh expensive design of the transformer but it's uh it can't be completely eliminated the load can overcome the effect that's what we showed with the leading you know if we had a capacitive load it can change the regulation and this is actually what people did before they had power electronics. They they actually used capacitors to to do what you're saying to get uh, exactly. They could tune this to get one. They could say, "I got one here, and I got one here." Well, they have to add a capacitor over on the other side to get that. Does that make sense? Yeah, got it. Yeah, so. So anyway, it's yeah, it's a trick that you got to know this impedance. And uh, now here's another thing that the base uh, and per unitization really gives us some good insights here. In per unit, then let's typically regulation is all is always defined from the source side. So if you're doing a regulation problem, you're going to reference everything over to the primary side, and you're going to use the uh, rated uh, voltage uh, as your base. And so I've got a, a V base now of the rated primary side voltage. And if I were then to divide and convert these to per unit quantities, that's what I just did right here, and then this equation simplifies a lot. And here's your Here's your equation for regulation. And so what, what that's really telling me is if I want to know my regulation, uh, I really just need to know uh, the per unit. I need to know, I need to find V2 prime, the magnitude of it and then divide by the uh, V1 rated. Because that's what this is, V2, which is my per unit. That's what this is. 
of E2 is equal to V2 prime divided by magnitude divided by V1 rated. So if I know that, I just take that number and subtract it from 1. And it may be 0, it might be positive, it might be negative. And these little ideas here help us understand, you know, why that's the case. That's it. I mean, pretty much, and we're out of time, and I got a paper in 15 minutes. But I, uh, we got through single phase. We didn't get to the three phase, but that's, I think, uh, that's, that's acceptable. Um, we're right at three phase. And uh, so everything for the exam, we're done. This, you're not going to cover anything more. Next time, we're going to talk about three phase. And just to kind of give you a precursor of that, uh, I'll post uh, a, a handout right away because I've got it written. Because it's going to take us the whole period, probably. But this, if you want to uh, study ahead of time on three phase, there's some, I don't know what the figure number is, but there's some figures in the book. And this is where I start right there. And we go through uh, different transformer connections. And I'm going to go through and show you what you're doing physically. So there's the Y and Y. There's the Y delta. There's the delta Y. And the delta delta. And I'm going to show you, okay, what does that mean and how do we get ourselves back to an equivalent circuit, a single phase uh, equivalent circuit so we can just analyze the problem simply. And that's really the bulk of the rest of chapter two for three phase.